it is my distinct uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, um, Father Patrick Dubois, um, the president and founder of Yahad in Unum. I believe he will tell us uh, a little later um, a little bit more about his um, organization. In 2015, Father Patrick Dubois launched the uh, initiative Action Yazidis, which um, seeks to uncover facts um, of the Yazidi genocide committed by ISIS. He is the uh, former director of the National Service of French Bishops for Relations with Judaism and is uh, presently advisor to the Commission of the Holy See for Religious Relations with the Jews. Uh, Father Dubois holds several degrees and honorary degrees. He is the recipient of the LBJ Moral Courage Award by the Holocaust Museum Houston and the Human Rights Prize from the Atlantis Foundation. He has written several books on his research and is the winner of the 2008 National Jewish Book Award. His most recent book is In the Broad Daylight, The Secret Procedures Behind the Holocaust. And uh, now please, uh, Join me in welcoming Father Patrick Dubois. Merci beaucoup. When I hear all what I'm supposed to have done, I think I'm ready to die, you know. <laughs> so um, the subject is not easy when you speak from France, because I'm half here, half in France. And as introduction, I would say that um, I am on the ground for anti-Semitism since now 27 years. It means at every, um, at every event, we phone to each other and we think what to do. Because uh, unfortunately, the story is not finished. So first, the first reflection I will bring is that a particularity of anti-Semitism in France, it is that it has never been homogeneous. Even in the 19th century, even before Dreyfus Affair, appeared a strangely a federation of anti-Semites. We called it Anti-Semite League. I think it's one of the particularities of France. What did it mean? So it was driven by Edouard Drummond, who wrote La France Juive, and uh, I speak about that because I think now we come back to that same level. He built a narrative with, uh, where Jews were guilty, I would say, of everything. They were, of course, accused of having killed Jesus with a classic uh, Christian narrative at the period. Drummond himself was a kind of Catholic he arranged to be seen as Catholic. But more deeply in his book, there was also an accusation that the Jews are a nomadic tribe. And I think that it's more deep, a tribe coming from anywhere else, but not from our country. A tribe coming from desert, a, a tribe coming where place when we grow animals, and suddenly arrived in our country and introduced false history. Mainly Catholic anti-Semitism and this one were right, right side anti-Semitism. But strangely, in the same narrative, because La France Juive is a very thick book and it, has, it was a very real success, he published more books than Emile Zola. In the same narrative, Drummond accuses the Jews to be capitalist, to handling capitalism in the country, and to work to build, finally, the poorest people in the country. The misery was designated as an, a Jewish initiative. So I say that because it was very strong. It was normally from left side. It was an heritage from Blanqui during the French Revolution. But suddenly it was fitting well with the Catholic version 
and the right side version is the same book. They're not, La France Juive is only one book. And all the affairs are connected to each other. So what was strange also, normally the left side at that period didn't like at all the right side. And the Catholic didn't like at all the anti-Catholic. But suddenly they agreed about one point. They never agreed to kill the Jews, but they agreed on one point that the Jews had to go, to go out of France. Like they had to go out of Poland, like they had to go out of Germany. And this federation let every entity autonome. It means that the Catholic stayed Catholic, the left side stayed left side, and the right side also. But nevertheless, they have a national narrative of French history in which everybody could identify himself. I will give you an example, very strange after so many years. They said that Saint Bernadette, who is a saint in the Catholic tradition, who says she saw Mary in Lourdes, that she has been strongly accused in the village of Lourdes because there were Jews in the village. And so suddenly, even the persecution of Bernadette was a Jewish affair. A market in Paris burned with hundreds of people. And suddenly, it was also a Jewish affair. So all the book, I would say, anything that happened from the revolution to a market with burning was because of the Jews. This narrative has been extremely well diffused until the smallest village of France. There was a calendar that you could cut from the book. And every farm, you have the calendar. And all the priests, I would say, in the small village were advertising La France Juive. Also, it was concerning for the church, but the church lost the power on the population because of the Jewish revolution. The revolution was done only because of the Jews. That was a long time ago. We could say it's, it's no more here. Arrived after in the 20th century, in addition, the pseudo-scientific antisemitism who designated the Jews as parasites, as rats, are genetically inferior. Again, strangely, this narrative began to fit with the others. The left side narrative, Jews are capitalists. The right side narrative, Jews are foreigners taking the country. The Catholic narrative, they kill Jesus. And the pseudo-scientific narrative, they are like rats. And all that made a national narrative. Imagine the title. It was not the Jews. It was La France Juive. It means to reveal the hidden face of France, who in fact was Jew. I think in the bottom line, it was to, de to designate to the public opinion Jews as scapegoats of everything. And it's so easy to do it until now. Suddenly, Holocaust. Holocaust, as you know, all these anti-Semites were finally not sad to see the Jews be arrested, to see the Jews be put in a camp in Drancy, and put in a train and disappear from the landscape, and also to have the houses and the belongings of the Jews. But after the Holocaust arrived a taboo in French society. It means from, I estimate, from after war until the year 2005, if you said you were anti-Jew, you were immediately accused to be a Nazi, to be a fascist, to be a, a pro-Hitlerian. So you couldn't say it. But this taboo now doesn't exist anymore. Me, I will date the big changement in 2005. You know, in 2005, it was a huge, huge commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. I was myself 
in Auschwitz for this ceremony. And during one year, we had one movie about Auschwitz nearly per week in the TV. Myself, I felt it was a catastrophe. Because after people say, OK, now 50 years, we paid the bill. It's OK. We are free of Hitler. We can show that we are anti-Semite, finally, as we have always been. So I would say suddenly, in many discussions, before you couldn't say you were anti-Jew, and after you couldn't say you were pro-Jew, before you were accused to be a Nazi, after you were accused to be a Zionist. And so until now, I would say that the classic music, when you are in private meetings without any Jew in the room, if suddenly you say you come back from Israel, or you come back from a Jewish meeting, or whatever, there is always somebody who will make a remark. I want now to use a slideshow to explain a little bit my demonstration. We can begin. So it was a long time ago. You remember Sturmer, but I, see, I give this example in Germany, but I, we have the same example in France, because Drummond was publishing a daily paper. Uh, and I would say the, this, what was always said, the Jews are our misfortune. Next. I always say we are now eight years after. This note too quickly. And so for me, a big shift also is the death of Elie Wiesel. We are, you know, imagine after Pittsburgh if Elie Wiesel was still alive. He would be interviewed all over the planet. You must know for you, you consider him as American. In France, he was speaking so well French, but we consider him as French. And he spoke in many, many countries. And his voice was accepted in any community, Jew or non-Jew. I cannot tell you how many Catholic schools are reading the books of Elie Wiesel. Suddenly, we have no more face like that. We recognize at this level of ethic for the planet. In Europe, next, we had Mrs. Simone Weil. It was the same. She was a survivor. She was also minister. She was president of European Commission. She, nothing was frightening her. She spoke any time. And same thing, she disappeared. And in France, we have no more Simone Veil. We have nobody like that. So it's not only the disappearance of the survivors, but the appearance of the public faces who were in Auschwitz or were in extermination places and have the legacy to speak at an ethical level without any organization behind them, only by themselves. So for us, for us, it's a big, big difference. Next. So I will show you, actually, our peers, far right anti-Semitism. So you know, the beginning, everybody knows, was Mr. Le Pen. Mr. Le Pen is a strange and complicated person. Nevertheless, now, <laughs> his party has been recognized sometime with 34% of French. And um, he began to make noise. He was very smart, introducing small phrases. And if you ask the French what Mr. Le Pen thinks about the Jews, he will tell you one thing. The gas chambers were only a detail in history of the war. And he made noise with that. He was confronted in front of judges. He didn't care. So let's listen to him. Madame le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, euh, je me suis borné à dire que les chambres à gaz étaient un détail de l'histoire de la guerre mondiale. I just said that the gas chambers were a detail est, of Second World est, War history, which is clear. Ce qui est une évidence. <coughs> I remember at the time, Madam President, I was fined 200,000 euros for damages and interest. That proves the state we find the freedom of speech and expression in Europe and France. So 
So Mr. Le Pen was spreading phrases like that. And you know, when I was a child, because Mr. Le Pen is speaking, even when I was a child, he was already speaking. And so we ran at the TV. It was funny to see Mr. Le Pen because he was 1%, 2% of election. We knew he would win no vote. It was like a far right crazy guy. So it was like a puppet. But I can tell you today in France, don't say that the party of Mrs. Le Pen is nothing. It's a big mistake. And of course, she will tell you she is far from the father, but all the friends of the father are still in the same political party. Next. Far left anti semitism next. I would say it's always this kind of image. That's an old image. It was beginning of the 20th, but we have this kind of image everywhere. Jews are capitalists. They possess two thirds of the among 100 Jews, among etc., etc. 80 capitalists, about 100,000 French, etc., etc. So it's the image, and strangely, they concentrate on one name, the Rothschild. Drummond was completely obsessed by the family Rothschild that we have in every cartoon, but now, again, the poor family Rothschild that I know. They are in every cartoon. I cannot imagine the level of security they need for their family. Next. See this cartoon. And that's very usual, and that's very frequent. Rothschild is accused to feed ISIS, Al-Qaeda, CIA, Israel, Boko Haram. It's why I tell you a narrative with global. They don't care, Israel and Boko Haram, Israel and ISIS, Israel and CIA. For them, it's all the same music. Why? Because of Rothschild. Me, I know the family Rothschild. It's true they are not poor. But I don't imagine them be able to finance all these affairs. And they are very far from that. And I can tell you, I take frequently Uber. I cannot take subway for security reasons in France. And many drivers always explain to me that ISIS and Boko Haram and all that, it's purely a Jewish affair. It's behind the screen is Jews. And they believe it very deeply. So it's not only a slogan. It's what we call, in France, left side anti-Semitism. But it's like we try to make category in a field where now there is no more category. Next. This drawing was during the election of Macron. The problem is that Macron was employed by Mr. Rothschild. He was working in Bank Rothschild for David Rothschild, and he's always accused, En Marche is a slogan of his political party, to carry the planet and Mr. Rothschild above the planet. We have that nearly every week. As far as I know it, there are other places, that surely they can find more. So, and Strangely, uh, he's not Jew at all, Macron, but for them, he's under the Jewish power. So anything bad that happens actually in France, it's why? Because of the Jews. Next. Islamic anti-Semitism is very difficult to say because people say, oh, come on, uh, you cannot be anti-Muslim, and I am not an anti-Muslim. But one day, the president of the CRIF, Roger Kuckerman, said publicly in front of 2,000 people and President Hollande that all the Jews of France who have been killed have been killed by Muslims. It was a catastrophe. He said not all the Muslims are killers, but nevertheless. And so we have also, we, I signed a petition with 300 personalities to call the Muslim leaders in France to try to explain that they cannot be Muslim and anti-Jew in France. And uh, we had suddenly a fatwa against the 300 people who signed this paper. Next. So, let's, no, just one moment. We will listen because in France, the problem, I say that because it's very different from here. The Muslims who are deeply, deeply anti-Jews today who are young and who committed uh, violent acts against the Jews are all connected to ISIS. They follow Baghdadi. 
And Baghdadi didn't make many messages. He made only one by video and the other by audio. But always it's difficult to know if it's really him or not. But this one has been officially recognized by Baghdadi. Let's listen. ما نسينا فلسطين لحظة وبإذن الله لن ننساها وقريبا قريبا بإذن الله تسمعون دبيب المجاهدين وها نحن نقترب منكم يوما بعد يوم لن تهنؤوا في فلسطين أبدا يا يهود ولن تكون داركم وأرضكم لن تكون فلسطين إلا مقبرة لكم وما جمعكم الله فيها إلا ليقتلكم المسلمون so, of course, you can say it's nothing to do with France, it's concerning Israel and the Palestinians, but if you are in France, after this message, this message was everywhere and in every uh, art Muslim organization, because we have, unfortunately, Wahhabite groups who spread this kind of message. Next. So this one is something more difficult for us, because it was a proclamation from the Imam of Toulouse. So double difficulty, Toulouse is in France, but Toulouse also is a place where was the shooting of the Jews. And so this Imam suddenly in Arabic explained, Adit were really from Quran, but to say that from Toulouse in Arabic in France made a big noise. So until now he's under a trial and the Jews are pushing to judge him and to say him to go away of the territory. Let's listen to him. He's, he's French, officially. فيقول الشجر والحجر يا مسلم يا عبد الله هذا يهودي خلفي تعال فاقتله. So that's also part of the Muslim tradition, but of course it's not part of something we highlight normally. And this Imam said that many, many times in Toulouse, where Jewish family has been assassinated by Mohammed Merah. So suddenly it's not easy. Uh, politically, the government tried to downtown the problem, and Jewish people tried to say, come on, we cannot accept that one imam in Toulouse, in a place of killing of Jews, somebody's preaching, but it will, be, it will arrive sooner or later again. Next. So, after saying that, we are no more in the period of Drummond, but we are in a period where new people arrived and are spreading a narrative which is not far right, not left right, not Islamic, but purely anti-Jew. And very, very successful. And among them, a humorist called Dieudonné. So Dieudonné is a personal friend with Forisson. Who is Forisson? Forisson is the first guy who built the theory of deniers in France. He died recently. He always denied Auschwitz. He went in Auschwitz. He took pieces of the gas camber, explaining it never happened, etc., etc. And he's absolutely, he's like the godfather of the deniers in Europe. And suddenly, Dieudonné, who is a humorist, he called for his son to come during a play. And you will see, he always invite a worker suited in blue with a yellow star. That's Dieudonné. Yes, that's for his song. Alors là, sachez en tout cas une chose, vos applaudissements vont retentir, vous verrez dans les médias dès demain matin, peut-être même jusqu'à jusqu assez loin. Robert, euh, je crois que vous méritez bien ce prix. Alors, le, le sketch, le sketch ne serait pas complet. So Jackie is a guy suited with a star. So stop, stop. 
So Jackie is suited for him like a deportee with a blue, yellow star and bringing the decoration to the chief of the deniers because for Dieudonné say in France you cannot do any meeting with a survivor. You need a survivor, so I have my false survivor with Jackie, my worker. You must know that this show is in all France and always strange French humor. It's difficult to understand because we don't make humor like other countries. But uh, uh, it's like advertising that. He advertises the, the false deportee and he will give a recognition to Forisson as the most irrespectable, non-respectable person in France. Of course, they went sent to justice immediately and in justice they said it again and again. Yeah, no, go. So you must understand that uh, at the beginning, when we saw Dieudonné arriving and making a show every night, because he's very well known in France, we were thinking the people were coming to the shows were Arabic or black refugee or that. So we sent journalists, not at all. They were classic French, white, from our country, from the village, from the small city, and very, very nice to upload that no gas camper exists and so on and so on, because there are a lot of jokes. All the, all the show. He has trials about trials, but he doesn't care. So I would say Dieudonné, Forisson, and Soral. Soral is a thinker, he's like the kind of academic guy who is serving the soup of the anti Semite. But they have their own narrative. It's not a narrative with left side, not right side, not, uh, it's La France Juive. We come back to that, La France Juive. Let's next. So Mr. Soral, is not, his name is not Soral, is ultra well known also. Let's see one small extract. So that's what he's spreading. That is newspaper. You see the date? I try to find fresh meat. So October 27. So his website, the problem, is that we cannot accuse anything because he is in America. And he says freedom of speech. Because in my country it's not legal. But we cannot do anything in France because it's not from a French in initiative. But it's Soral who does it. And he had always, always things like that. Next. Look at it. To put gas on the Jew uh, in a new way. Same thing. And stops before, you see, gas.com. And so if you put on that, you will have something else about the gas and the Jews today. Next. Always he pinpoints the Jews in America who are finally hidden and we have to put a yellow star again and are managing America today. Next. But the last one from this week, it was a scandal everywhere. So to say that Rothschild, same thing, is handling Macron to make very expensive tax about oil and to kill fi finally the country. But strangely, he accused Rothschild to be Judeo-Bolshevik. So I think Rothschild has been accused about many things in his life, but never to be Bolshevik. I say that because it's to show you it's a, it's a narrative. We, have not to, to, we are not in the thing to, to find a cohesion politically. Because when you say Judeo Bolshevik, it remembers all the accusations of Hitler, Himmler, etc., about the Jews. But to say Rothschild, you see very well done the, the noise, the noise, Rothschild, benzene with up, and Mr. Uh, Macron with a Soviet place. It's uh, unthinkable. And it works. And it works. That's the most recent we had makes a lot of noise. You can see that in every website of the Jewish organization asking for justice to stop this website, but we cannot because it's American in French. Next. Oh, something else. 
is to show that now we have events always. This event took place in a university in France, in the University, I think, of Medicine. It was also in October 2008. And they decided to name every Jew, every room, and what he is like, really. You know, it's a, an upscale university. For us, in France, to study medicine is difficult. So we couldn't believe what they did. Next. So I will finish, and I cannot avoid that, to say that we cannot fight anti-Semitism in France like we did before. It's like you with Pittsburgh. But unfortunately, in France, we had many Pittsburgh. When we had the first one, we were thinking it would be the last one, but it was not the last one. When we had the second one, we were thinking it would be the last one, etc., etc. And now nobody thinks it's the last one. Go on. So that the first Jew was being killed, Ilan Alimi. You know, 12 years ago, he has been trapped by a girl who gave an appointment after he has been taken by a group. They tortured him during 27 days, thinking that the family was rich because she was Jew. In fact, the mother was volunteer in the Jewish organization and had no money, so they could not pay. They left him dying naked in the street, and he died. At that period, we were all moved, like for you in Pittsburgh. But now, no more. Next. So that was the guy who organized. He's still in jail, Yosef Fofana. And he's still proud. And even from the jail, he edited many, many messages saying that he was so proud to have been a killer of a Jew. Next. So that's the famous family of Toulouse. This family has been killed by one guy. It was a family Sandler. And uh, the worst was from the little girl, because she was not killed. And suddenly, Mohamed Mera realized she was not killed. He took her like that, and he shot her by a bullet in the head. Next. And you know, at the beginning, the media tried to say, we don't know really for why he did that. And I will show you, a media was at the moment. Today, everybody knows he was in Iraq, he was in Syria, and he was a terrorist. But at the moment, it was difficult to say that because to speak about violence of radical Muslims against the Jews is always a political, sensitive subject because we are selling a lot of things to the Saudis and to other people. Next. Now in Toulouse, if you might. That was a TV emission just after. For Mohamed Mera, the road to radicalization ran from a delinquent childhood in Toulouse to Afghanistan. And he claimed to have had military training with al-Qaeda in a tribal zone over the border in Pakistan, according to prosecutors. They say Mera made his own way there without using networks under surveillance by Western intelligence. But he was already on the watch list of France's security services after his return last year. Before the dramatic events of recent days, however, authorities say there was no evidence Mera may have been planning a killing spree. How could neighbors have known? Back home, he liked football and nightclubbing, worked in a car body workshop, and showed no sign of militancy, friends say. Yet other accounts describe a man who watched videos on the internet of Islamist beheadings. Mera is said to have expressed a wish to die with weapons in his hands. So Mera effectively has been killed by the police. And now we have completely another version. He had a big network behind him. He was connected to ISIS. His brother was always arrested. The mom said always she was very proud that he was now in heaven, and so on and so on. So now we have completely changed our vision. But at the period, it was very, very sensitive to say that somebody, because he was connected to terrorists, killed a Jew in France. Next. So these people were killed in the Museum of Brussels by him, he's in jail since that period, and he never accepted to speak to anybody. He has no lawyer, nothing, he refused to speak to anybody, so we know absolutely nothing. Next. So after these four men were killed in a kosher shop, so uh, same thing, the guy who killed them, normally he was from Mali, 
he took a honeymoon trip to Madrid with his wife. He paid a flight ticket to his wife to go to Syria. He came to Paris. He killed the Jews. He died. And his wife, after the same day, sent a message from Syria calling to kill the Jews in France. Next. So that's a complicated case about whom we are working now. So it's uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Alimi. So Sarah Alimi was orthodox. She was a teacher. She was very well known. She was not very rich. And uh, suddenly, one of the neighbors that she knew since long time, he entered in a room. He stabbed her to death. And after, he threw her from a building from eighth floor. And until now, it's not possible to say she has been killed for an anti-Semite reason. And, uh, uh, I, and the guy recognized it, in fact. But it's so very sensitive. Next. So that's a picture of the guy. I say that because they are completely from different origins, from different roads, and all of them are young. Next. So that's the last one, Mrs. Knoll. She, is a surv she was a survivor, and she has been stabbed to death and burnt alive. And she, by a neighbor, the neighbor, she knew him since he was a boy, because it was a neighbor. And she was helping him since he was a child. And suddenly, with another person, he killed them. And the son of Mrs. Knoll, today, it's every week at the TV, asking that we recognize his mom has been killed because she was a Jew. And it's not accepted. And always the same argument. She's a Jew. She must have money. Next. Perhaps we go. Uh, yeah, that's the last one of this week. Two Jews teenagers were assaulted in separated incidents in Paris area. The police are investigating as possible. Was attacked about 5 p.m. by three men in Paris, etc. It's every day. If I showed you the list of attacks we have in France, you couldn't believe. I only look for the last attack of this week. I say that because for us, anti-Semitism in France, it's a narrative first. It's a narrative we're spreading to very different people. People who are very far from anything, who hate nobody except the Jews. Sometimes they hate the Jews and the foreigners. Sometimes they hate the Jews and the Muslim, and sometimes they hate only the Jews. It can concern people who are Christian, who are not Christian, people who are Muslim, who are not Muslim, people who are poor or are rich. And this narrative suddenly made legal and possible attack and killing. So for, for the moment, the problem we have in France is to investigate and to clarify the attack against the Jews. And my organization, Yarad, I will accept, I am trying to raise money for that, to, to investigate about the violence against the Jews in France. Because today, it's considered a pure Jewish affair. It concerns nobody except the Jews. And there is no reason that non-Jew are worried about that except police and justice. So thank you so, so much, and every question is possible. Thank you so much, Father Dubois, for this um, very important um, presentation, and um, at the same time, extremely disturbing. We've actually discussed uh, France uh, um, earlier this um, morning, and um, what, from what we heard of, from our speakers, uh, uh, we may conclude that uh, France uh, seems to be the most uh, challenging country for the uh, Jewish community uh, in Europe today. So um, let me ask you, what is the um, future of Jewish uh, community in your country, and uh, given the uh, rising, uh, not only anti-Semitism, but actually the anti uh, violence uh, motivated by anti-Semitism. And also, um, my question is actually twofold. I also would like to ask about the future of uh, your organization, Yahad Inunim. Even though it is not a um, Jewish organization, nevertheless, you focus your work on um, preserving the memory of the Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. So there are two questions. Uh, it depends. I would say the, the enemy of the Jews make everything the Jews to go, to go from France. But you know also it's the biggest Jewish community in Europe. So it's not by hasard that they attack this, this community. Uh, so many Jews are thinking to make Aliyah. 
And I know, of course, since working with the Jews in 27 years, I begin to know a certain number of them. And they say there is not a Shabbos dinner when we don't raise the question, do we stay or do we go? And uh, I remember Kukerman, who is the ex-president of CRIF, saying now he's retired. He said there is no future for the Jews in France anymore. It's burnt. On the other side, the enemy of the Jews are very happy because they succeeded. And I see them as a strategy of the ghetto to say, you cannot stay in France, you cannot stay in Germany, you cannot stay here, you cannot stay there. So you are like in a cage. And I think also for the French Jewish community, because you know, many Jews make Aliyah to Israel. But suddenly they awake in Israel more French than Jews. And so they make a second Aliyah to Miami. And so, uh, it's, it's true, you know, as I always say, they arrive in Israel and they say, no, we don't, we don't pay for university, that's for free. They say, but uh, you have to pay. No, we are French. No, you are Jews. And so after you have to pay for social security, they say, no, you are French. No, you are Jews. So at moments they say, oh, it's beginning to be difficult. And so some of them stay, of course, and I know a lot of them will stay, but I know also a lot of them who came back or went to Miami or some, somewhere else. And so I would say... Uh, the problem is that me always say to the Jews, great, that a part of you thinks to go, but don't forget it's a strategy and the, for the, your enemies. And also that uh, for the French Jews, when they saw what happened in Pittsburgh, they say, oh, they begin the same thing in America. In all the newspapers, it was this question, is it the beginning of the French situation in America? Because when we saw the first killing, we were thinking it was only one affair and we will arrange well with the police and with intelligence and that no more killing will happen anymore in France. But now any government doesn't know what to do. So, and the second question for my organization, we have so much investigated about outside of France that now uh, seeing all the attacks against the Jews who are daily in any places, in universities, in, uh, in, in poor suburbs, in the middle of center, that I, I have, I'm thinking to investigate about crimes against the Jews in France because we have also to support the Jews, otherwise it will be considered a pure Jewish affair. It's like uh, uh, Jews have problems with other people in France, but it's not a French affair. So, uh, and also to support the fact that many attacks are anti-Semite and not for the moment recognized legally as anti-Semite. Now if you said you, you kill a Jew but you stole his money, People say, no, they killed a Jew because she had money in her pocket. But me, I study Holocaust, and all the people who are killed by Ukrainian or by Polish, uh, they didn't let the house empty, uh, full of gold. And uh, as I say, the SS also was not a non-profit. And so uh, the killers also today are not non-profit. But it doesn't mean it's not anti-Semite. Um, let me um, change uh, topic um, for a minute and uh, jump into the question of preserving the uh, memory of the of the Holocaust. Do you mention um, Holocaust um, deniers, uh, well-known um, Holocaust deniers, and also um, you mention uh, the important work of um, Elie Wiesel, who certainly changed the way we look at the uh, um, Holocaust, how we commemorate the Holocaust, and also how we educate about the uh, about the uh, Jewish experience uh, during World War II. Um, and I'd like to, what Elie Wiesel once said, uh, let me quote, our remembering is an act of uh, generosity aimed at uh, saving men and women from apathy of evil, if not from evil itself. We must remember for our own sake, for the sake of our own humanity. Indifference to the victims would result inevitably in indifference to ourselves. End of quote. In recent years or even months, um, we encountered something what Deborah, uh, Deborah Lipstadt calls uh, softcore Holocaust denial. It's often expressed in uh, the digitization of the Holocaust or downplaying Jewish uh, suffering during World War II. So let me ask you, is there anything that we can do or what can we do to safeguard the memory of the Holocaust free of uh, politicization, trivialization, um, and also all, the, all these new forms of um, Holocaust um, denial? Uh, 
distortions? For me, according to my experience, I make conferences nearly all over the world. What I discovered after a certain moment is that there are a legacy of a Holocaust and Hitler in, in the other sense, in the other side. I mean, I never had to introduce Hitler in any country. They always know Hitler. We we'll never forget. I book. I found two, three books of uh, of uh, about Hitler in uh, Iraq, in a bookstore, and there were ten books, pro Hitler. And I bought three books to show what we could find. And I was looking for a non-transparent bag, because in France, if you buy a book about Hitler, pro Hitler, you'll have certain problems. And uh, yeah, not at all. I went uh, in the market with my bag with three books of Hitler. It was very banal. But I wouldn't go to China and to Latin America and so on. Stalin is not known as mass killer. Uh, Mao is not known, but Hitler is known. So he has a legacy. And I say also, uh, I'm fighting in Iraq against ISIS, and uh, this terrorist organization are also very proud about Hitler. I'm sure they were very proud about the guy of Pittsburgh. I'm sure he has been declared a hero the same day. And so I think there is a legacy of Hitler, and a legacy of Holocaust, but on the black side. And so we have to teach because we have to confront these people. It's, for me, to teach Holocaust is not to teach the past, it's to heal the future. And to say to the people, be careful, be careful. One day or another, you can be tempted by this kind of ideology. You feel safe now because you are in a quiet place. You never know. And uh, uh, I think we have to train young generation to be strong because suddenly they will never see a survivor because survivor will be dead. Uh, they will meet a lot of people who deny Holocaust existed. They will be in so many countries where we don't teach Holocaust at all in high school. And also they will meet crowds and crowds who say it never existed. And so at one moment they will say, come on, first history of grand grandpa, I have carried that on my shoulders, and what for? So I think we have a way to teach in another way to say, let's study the crimes. Let's study the legacy of the crime. You know, between a shooting by an Einsatz group and a shooting by ISIS, out of ideology, I don't see really the difference. Thank you very much. And we have uh, still time for um, questions from the audience. So, so oh. um, do we have microphone? Can Jonathan? Could you? I was, you talk about the, these violent crimes against Jews in France. So my question is, are these violent crimes that you talk about Jews in France part of a larger trend of street violence against innocent persons in general? Or do you, or do you see that this violence in the streets is primarily directed at unfavored persons like persons perceived to be Jewish, that kind of thing? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, according to ISIS crimes, uh, they killed also other people. When they shot in the discotheque, uh, and they shot in the, the bars, they shot to anybody. But I would say uh, Jews are always in the front line. And the percentage of anti-Jew attack among all the attack is completely huge concerning the small quantity of Jews we have in France. So no. we. I give you an example. We had a very left side demonstration where nothing to do with Israel and nothing to do. And suddenly they passed in the street and suddenly they saw a synagogue. And so they tried to destroy the door of the synagogue with the Jews inside. And they don't do that uh, everywhere. No, unfortunately, Jews are a target. And unfortunately, you see that very concretely because in every synagogue today there is police and army. There was a lady in the, uh, the, lady in the um, back row, please. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on French Protestants, uh, their role, past and present? Um, and I have in my mind a place like Le Chambon, Soulignon. Uh, but could you comment on, in this mix of French Protestants? Thank you. I couldn't even make you, make you comment about French Catholics. So, um, you know, I don't know. French Protestants are very diversified between the evangelical groups who are very, very connected to Israel. And uh, I, I cannot answer. Even if you ask me as a Catholic, I couldn't answer. You know, we are a very secular country. So don't think that the Catholic have a reaction and the Protestant have a reaction and the Buddhist have a reaction, because really, first of all, we are French. 
And as I told you, the narrative of Dieudonné, uh, I cannot tell you what is a religion. You must know also, in, in, in France, it's forbidden to ask when you employ somebody about the religion. So uh, it's, part, it's considered like discrimination. So I cannot answer to your question. It's too complicated, and uh, I, it should take me six months of investigation to know the answer. And I'm not sure I would get it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask about I th the remarks. I think it was the Prime Minister of France, maybe after the shooting in the supermarket, when he said, and we felt very happy about that in the United States, uh, telling the Jewish people not to leave, not to be afraid to make He says, France will not be France without the Jews. I was wondering, is that a nice statement, a po political statement, or is, is his government sort of to do something to make the Jews feel more comfortable? All governments try to do something. And I, I think you speak about Mr. Valls, uh, but you know Valls left France. <laughs> He's candidate to the municipality of, uh, of, uh, in Spain. So he is no more in France because he was punished. And so uh, he's in Barcelona now. And uh, he was also married to a French lady and accused every day to have the Mossad at home. So he was really with the Jews, Vals. He did a lot. He, what he could do. The problem also is that you can speak about anti-Semitism in France as long as you don't mention Islam. When you begin to mention the Islamic groups who are really against the Jews today, oof, here it's a political boiling question and a business question for our foreign affairs. So I say that because it's complex. It's complex today. If you say a Jew has been attacked, but suddenly uh, we cannot know the name of the guy, because if the name is an Islamic name, immediately the Jew will react and say again, again. And, um, it's complex to, to answer to this question, but it's a political question. It's a national interest. So that's a problem. Um, you, you may thank you for your presentation, um, and you gave us a large um, understand a larger understanding of the different forces that bring anti-Semitism to the fore in France. And then you mentioned Du Donnet a couple of times, and I remember reading that, um, thinking, what made him uh, anti-Semitic? What do we know? He's somebody who had a Jewish partner, and there was, no, there was nothing in the newspapers in France, when I was in France, giving us any understanding. Where did that come from? It's, I can see you don't know, but... I don't I, know. He was friends with a Jew. Me. He had a conflict with a Jew. We and had a uh, conflict he with him. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, Mia... It's like if you ask to people why people don't like the fish. All right. You know, when so you make no a answer. dinner, you say, is there anybody who doesn't like fish? And actually, with the Jews, it's the same in France. A big part of the population doesn't like the Jews, like other people don't like the fish. They don't know why, but they don't like it. And, so, and also, the other thing is that Dieudonné, if he has not the fact to be anti-Jew, he would be much less successful. All right, that's... Because you saw the crowd applauding to Forisson. Forisson is really the worst figure in my country, denying Auschwitz, always denying the Jews, denying Holocaust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see how he was received. It was 5,000 people. So, uh, and it was in every TV the day after. So he's also very successful because of that. Imagine when he rent today a theater to make a show, he had to rent it through the name of his wife because otherwise it's forbidden by law. But he always succeeds, and that is. These people are very, very reckless to do it. And also, he, the other part is that we discovered that he makes a huge money. He's, also a, he's not also a non-profit, uh, Mr. Diodonet. I say that because when you are these groups, it's uh, different crimes in one crime. It's not only to hate the Jews. Thanks for your presentation. Um, do you think that um, um, eliminating the, the anti-hate um, speech laws in France, would uh, what, what type of impact would that have on anti-Semitism? Worse, you know, better? 
And uh, would you, what do you recommend for French Jewry? Should they make Aliyah? You know, it's not me to make, to make the Jew do an Aliyah. But uh, I always say to the Jew, be strong, because if you go, it's their dream. They want you to go to France, out of France. The same group want you to go out of Palestine. It's the first good target. You saw the Imam say when we will be in Palestine, boom. And so they have a strategy in their mind to say oh, sooner or later they will disappear from the screen. But for them, their obsession is not France, it's Palestine. And so don't think that uh, these people will stop. They are not interested in the Palestinians. They have no connection with the Palestinians. They are interested because they are Jews in the region. Because don't think that a huge money is coming from France to the Palestinians. It's not true. Iran also perhaps will be a nuclear harm and it's only one with enough, you know, and you see the size of the country. But the Jews don't have an army in France. Yeah, but imagine, imagine if all the Jews have to go to Israel, uh, I think many, many crowds will be so happy to have succeeded. To, you, you have certain vision. Me, I'm, I'm, I'm speak Hebrew, I go frequently to Israel, but you can see it also at the last ghetto. No, but, my, my point is, if you're talking about these two, this running list of anti-Semitic events, and lethal anti-Semitism, which is on the rise in France. In France, France's security services, based on my writings and what I've... What I've reported, France's security services are totally overwhelmed in terms of tracking the number of jihadists in France. Jews, I think, are fundamentally unsafe in France. I think a detached, objective spectator could only conclude that Jews are endangered in France. So there has to be some discussion about if France's state security services, and this is my view, cannot protect Jews, then you have to talk about what can they do. So I think it's, it's something that, that one can't avoid. And then my yeah, second question. Yeah, but in one way, if you say to the Jews everywhere you are attacked, you must go out. Sooner or later, also, we have also a lot of French Jews who have been attacked in Israel. And we lost a lot of French Jews also in Israel by recent attacks. We lost also a lot of Jews. And so at the end, it's also, if you think the logic of the enemies of the Jews, it will be exactly that. Go out, go out, go out, go out of Pittsburgh. And if we go out of Pittsburgh, we'll try another city. I, I hope that in America in five years, you will tell, not tell me they are no more safe in America. Because today, when you see Pittsburgh, you're not so clear they are so safe. You know? And so uh, the strategy of the enemies is the strategy of the ghetto. For you, it's Aliyah. For them, it's go away. And after, of course, it's easier. So I, I agree. I understand perfectly the question of Aliyah, Mitzvah, and so on. I work with Israeli always, speak Hebrew. But for the French Jews, it's the biggest community of Europe. And by hazard, it's the one under attack. Thank you. And um, I think uh, we have time to take uh, one more question. So, let's have a please, sir. Eve Marie Sapansky, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. What is the role of the Vatican? Do you see the Vatican uh, playing a constructive role in education, in altering the context of these, this repulsive narrative? First, I'm, I, the only position I refused was to be appointed in Vatican. So uh, I was appointed and I didn't take this position. I'm really a person from the ground. So to answer this question is like for the Protestant, I would like to make a big speech of six months and explaining they did that and they are doing that and not that and they're missing that. In France, we are not waiting for Vatican to educate the people in France. We are a secular country. We have also Catholic churches. And of course, it's not Vatican who is directing the education in France. It's even unthinkable. It would be stopped immediately by the population. So I understand your question, but we are more in France. Inside Catholic school, I can tell you that most of the Catholic school go to an Holocaust museum uh, to study Holocaust. We try to make the maximum for that. And the threat is not coming actually from these groups not coming from these groups. It's not the regular. I would say the, the people who go to the mass in France are not the first group who is attacking the Jews in the street. For the moment, we are more concerned about the imams who are coming from outside, who don't speak French, and who are harassing the people like that. And of course, it's not the pope who can direct this imam. I think the taboo question is not about Christianity today in France. I say that it's always. Uh, 
Always people ask me about Poland and that, and I say this. To finish, I will say this typical French stupid joke. I say, okay, in Poland there are a lot of anti-Semites, but if you go in Champs Elysees and you hear a Polish in a shop, don't run away, we will not kill you. But if you see some Islamists with guns, run away. Well, thank you. I'm not sure this was an optimistic accent to uh, conclude this uh, conversation, but uh, please join me um, to, and let's give another round of applause to Shadow.